Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, book of Matthew, chapter 27. We're going to pick it up in verse 35 here in a moment. Christ is being led up to Golgotha, that's to say Calvary, uh, however you wish to say it, to be crucified. They've just offered him uh, a sponge of vinegar, which is a Roman soldier's poor wine, a poor man's wine, so to speak, instead of vinegar as we would call vinegar today. And naturally, he refused it. We're going to pick it up there in verse 35 as he continues and the crucifixion underway. 27, chapter 27, verse 35, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And of course, that's uh, from Psalms 22, which we'll, we'll be uh, going there in a, in a moment um, and see what, was, what happened uh, in that psalm predicting what would come. Verse 36, And sitting down, they watched him there. While this was taking place, he, naturally he was crucified and, and put on a cross between two malefactors. Verse 37, and they set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And of course, um, we, we know that in John 19, 19, the chief priest would come by and say, I don't like that. I told you he only claims to be. And of course, it was wrong anyway because he was the king of all Israel. Verse 38. Then were, then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And there this innocent one was in the middle of all this, um, these two sinners, this one that was perfect, the one that was being crucified for your benefit. Verse 39. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. Um, verse 40. And saying, now I want you to remember this real good. Remember this scripture. And saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, um, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Uh, and they keep mocking and, and uh, him. 41. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders. I mean, this is the whole um, high muckety ducks of the church system are mocking him as he's being crucified. What did they say? 42, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, and here they pronounce it properly, of all 12 tribes. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. You know, they still would not have. Uh, I truly do not believe they would have, even if he had um, disintegrated the cross and came down. It just wasn't in the books. It wasn't time. 43, remember these verses. They're important. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. And of course, um, again, from Psalms 22, they'll be saying this right in his face. 44, the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. And make note of that. Both of these thieves uh, mocking him as well, and yet before it ends, one of those thieves will be converted. Why, why would that happen? Well, we're going to find out. We'll have a pretty good idea. 
Verse 45, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all them, over all the land until the ninth hour. From 12 noon until 3 p.m., it was pitch black. I feel this is what caused one of the malefactors to say, whoa, they're, they're, they are crucifying the Lord. Because this was, you know, when does it turn pitch black at noon and it hangs all the way till 3 o'clock? And incidentally, what happens at 3 p.m.? That's when the chief priest on, on Passover goes into the Holy of Holies. You'll see what happens there in a later lecture. <clears throat> so no doubt, this is what converted one of the thieves because in another book, Christ would say to this one who would uh, revile the other thief to be quiet that truly this one is. He was in this day, Christ speaking, I will see thee in paradise, meaning I'm, I'm going to claim you, you're going. <clears throat> Verse 46, and about the ninth hour, that's about 3 p.m., Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatine. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This really shakes a lot of Christians. They feel like that if God's going to, if, if God's going to uh, forsake Christ, what is he going to do to me? Well, it just so happens God did not forsake Christ because, number one, you cannot forsake yourself. He was Emmanuel, God with us. But he was a scripture teacher. He was the living word. All he's doing is quoting scripture. And, and this is in Aramaic from the Greek to the Aramaic, and uh, his words were, and what was he quoting then, if he's quoting scripture? Well, he was quoting the Psalms. I told you to remember the verses we were covering because it's the 22nd Psalm, <coughs> and so it is that the 21st names him as uh, the, the dawn of Messiah, when Messiah comes, and the 22nd gives you the crucifixion. And and God speaking through David, uh, we read those words in Psalms 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? In other words, Christ is quoting this uh, song of the dawn of the day, which is what the heading means. And... Um, it was, Dan, it was David that spoke it, not, not the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ always called our Father, Father, not God. Okay. Verse 2, O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. I pray night and day. Verse 3, but thou art holy. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Verse 4, our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. He always does. That's why you can always trust him. He parted the Red Sea. He brought them across right in front of Sarah, Pharaoh's army. Verse 5, they cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. They were never confused. They were never disappointed. You always brought them through. And then David would say in verse 6, But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. They chased him. Uh, th this word, um, worm, is, um, is cocos, which is a crimson worm, which the color red uh, was die was made from and certainly I'm sure when Christ was repeating this psalm and I feel he I will prove to you that he repeated the whole thing while he was on the cross for a reason so that you would know this was written a thousand years before the crucifixion and yet every event was pre-recorded in this psalm that would take place at the foot of that cross basically and, and, uh, and so it is. Let's go with the next verse, verse 7. 
All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip and they shake the head saying, verse 8, what were they saying? I told you to remember that verse. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. And there we have that 43rd verse from, Psalm, from the uh, 27th chapter of Matthew. Written a thousand years before. And, and who said this? Not, not Israelites. Not the children of God, but the enemy repeated this verse. Whether they liked it or not. They were fulfilling the scripture of the living God. Verse 9. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. Verse 10. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Verse 11. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. I mean, they had all scattered. Left him alone. He was nailed to that cross uh, so that you could have forgiveness of sin. Why? Because he loves you. He cares. Verse 12. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. Bashan was known for its healthy, huge animals. Uh, 13. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a raving and a roaring lion, as they would call out against him, crucify him from that crowd. What a roaring bunch of uh, people that would come to do him in and turn loose a thief called Barabbas. Verse 14, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint, and my heart is like wax that is melted in the midst of my bowels. In other words, I'm nailed to this cross, and my arms are pulled out of socket, and I'm approaching that uh, dusk of dawn, the end of the day, and, and so it is, uh, verse 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My mouth is as dry as an old piece of broken pottery. And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. I'm thirsty. And thou hast brought me into the dust of, of death. Uh, in other words, the end of my day is coming here in the flesh uh, with his work being almost done, almost completed in the flesh, but eternally in the spirit. Verse 16, for dogs, that's to say my enemies uh, have compassed me. They're all around me. The assembly of the wicked hath enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. They nailed them to the cross. Again, beloved, I want to reiterate, a thousand years before it happened, then you can begin to understand why the he had to be that sacrificial lamb on that particular Passover, fulfilling this scripture, documenting to you that you can take faith in God's word because it's going to come to pass as it's written. Yes, even these end times. Verse 17, I may tell all my bones they look and they stare upon me. Verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. And there were the Roman soldiers gambling for his clothing at the foot of the cross. How could that be? Because God is in control. That's how it could be. All prearranged that these scriptures would come to pass exactly as they're written, just as all scripture shall come to pass exactly as it's written. The important thing is, do you understand? That's what's important, that you study the Word, that you search and you seek to find the truth. And then the truth shall never depart from you once you nail it, once, you, once God grants it to you. The truth is His Word. His Word is the truth. And when you absorb the inner meanings of His election, His children, then certainly... Um, you are blessed indeed. Verse 19, 
Be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. God never leaves us alone. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He certainly did not forsake this one, even at this time. Verse 20. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling. This word darling should be translated soul. That's what it is in the Hebrew. From the power of the dog. That's to say my enemies. Uh, deliver me from the hand of my enemies. He soon would be. Because uh, Joseph of Arimathea and others would take him down from that cross and, and uh, take him to the sepulchre, a new one, so that the prophecy from Isaiah chapter 53 that he would be buried among the wealthy, his own uncle. Verse 21, Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. There's no such thing as unicorns. They don't exist. And this word in the manuscripts is wild ox. You can feel free to correct that if you choose. Verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. That 22nd verse is very important. You can read it again in, in Hebrews chapter 2, where for the Christian, it tells you exactly why Christ was crucified the purpose behind it, and the fact that he would not ask you to do something he would not do himself. By that I mean being born in the flesh, for he was born in the flesh. Fulfilling the scripture, let us, uh, let us create man in our image, including himself. If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. But it would say in and to that congregation, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12 through 14, 14, giving you the reason he accomplished this. But let the whole congregation know with understanding why. He said, it is because I want to destroy death, which is to say the devil. And I'm quoting the 14th verse now from Hebrews chapter 2. In other words, God was bringing about the demise of Satan through the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Emmanuel, God with us, if Satan's little ones crying, crucify him, brought about the death of the Son, then certainly vengeance belonging to the Lord, the same equivalent was set for Satan himself into the lake of fire at the end of Revelation chapter 20. How precious our Father's word is, but the most rewarding words follow that 14th verse in Hebrews 2. It lets you know that he loves you enough. He's not going to ask you to do something he hasn't done himself. Only I've got some good news for you. He does it real good. You maybe don't. He does it perfect. And we all fall a little short because we're not our Father. And we're not the son, but certainly he was. And he, sh he cut that path and that swath, giving us the ability to follow if you so choose. So you declare that in the congregation. You make sure the congregation sees it, knows it, and understands it. Verse 23, ye that fear the Lord, you that love him, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, that's the house of Israel, that's the natural seed. Glorify him and fear him, revere him, all ye the seed of Israel, all tribes. Uh, why? Because he, deserved, he did this for you. Why would you not praise him? Verse 24, for he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. Don't you ever let someone get away with saying the God, that God forsook uh, Messiah on the cross. This verse documents it. He, neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard him in contact, knowing and understanding. And it's just likewise when you, as one of God's elect, when you let him know you love him and you have repented from all your sin, 
He hears you. Don't you ever doubt that. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Verse 25. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him, those that love him. Those vows of taking forth that word, of telling that congregation that this Psalms was quoted from the cross in its entirety to document to you the reason for the crucifixion and his love for you in so doing. Verse 26. The meek, that's the humble, shall eat and be satisfied from the word of God and shall praise the Lord that seek him. It's important that you seek. That takes action on your part. Your heart shall live forever. That is to say your soul, your very being, shall live forever when you do that. He paid that awesome price, making that available to you on simply believing. Verse 27, all the ends of the world, or you might even say at the ends of the world, shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. Every knee, on that first day of the millennium, on the first day of the Lord's day, every knee will bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. They will know he is the true Messiah and they put aside the fake in the abyss. Uh, verse 28, for the kingdom is the Lord's. That's the king and his dominion. He's the king and he's the Lord of lords. And he is the governor among the nations. He's in charge. He's in control. You want to join the, the winning party? It's the Christian party. And certainly uh, Christians following the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, then that is the way to go. That's God's way. Verse 29, to continue. All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. Nobody can work out their own salvation. There's only one Savior. He is the way and the true way. He is the only way. Nobody, nobody. Man has tried it in the beginning. In the great book of Genesis, they built the Tower of Babel so that they could never could a flood like Noah's ever take them out again. They would have their own uh, stairway right into heaven, saving their own souls. What happened? It brought God down. God just scattered them all over the world, put in different languages where they could not communicate to build that slimy brick tower. Uh, and when God had promised that he would never flood the earth again anyway with water, the only thing this earth will be flooded with in the near future is a flood, all right. It's a flood of lies from Satan pouring from his mouth the deception, and it's already rampant around the world with people being deceived into not learning the full truth of God's word, whereby they can make a stand against the false one that feel like they listen to those that would say, you don't have to understand God's word. You're going to be gone. I cannot imagine anyone dumb enough to let some man tell you you didn't have to understand God's word. He sent the letter to you, charging you to understand the letter. And you would let some man short-circuit the whole thing? What do you think that brings upon you? I've got, some good new, I've got some bad news for you. You don't want to go there. You cannot keep alive or bring work out your own salvation. You've got to do it his way. That's why he wrote this letter, this particular part of it, a thousand years before it would transpire so that you would know he's a man of his word, he's a father of his word, and you can believe every word of it. Uh, verse 30, to continue, a seed shall serve him. Do you know that he was thinking about the, the generation of the fig tree? This is his elect that he's talking about here. 
It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Well, what generation is that? The generation of the fig tree. Through the generation through which all prophecy would come to pass. And certainly, when you come to the knowledge of that, knowing and understanding that he remembered you while he was nailed to the cross, that generation. Verse 31, they shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. Uh, now, how can I document to you that he quoted all of this uh, particular psalm? Because in the Hebrew, that he hath done this is the equivalent of in the Greek in John 19, verse 30. Listen to me carefully. That he hath done this is the equivalent translated into the Greek, it is finished. In other words, he finished the whole psalm. And then it happened, as it is recorded in John 19, 30. How precious it is, our Father, letting us know beforehand, sending us a letter with the events, I mean like tomorrow's newspaper, documenting events long before to strengthen your faith. That's what it should do, knowing he's in charge. He knows exactly how it's going down, and he chooses his election to follow him, to absorb it, to be strengthened by his spirit, and to follow his very word. So we return then to the New Testament, and we return to Matthew chapter 27. We're going to pick it up with verse 47, where he, he quoted that Psalms 22. But after the words, Eli, Eli, some of, some of the people at the base thought he was saying, Elijah, Elijah, which being translated from the Greek is Elias, Elias. Uh, so this is what they would say. You can understand their confusion, not being students of the word. Verse um, 47, some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, this man calleth for Elias, which is to say from the Hebrew, Elijah. 48, and straightway or immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed to give him to drink. In other words, again, we, we covered Psalm 69, 21 that documents uh, they gave this. He refused it. And it's a good thing he did. Why? Because many people, even to this day, the Kenites, some of them say that they drugged him with that sponge on the cross, that he didn't really die, that, um, that he was drugged to overcome it, which is a bald-faced lie, okay? That's, that's not true, but uh, they, would, they still work at it, do they not? How amazing. But that all the more strengthens the Word of God. So... Uh, he refused it. Verse 49, the rest said, let be. Let us see whether Elias will come to save him. They're beginning with it being dark from 12 noon till 3 p.m. And these things happening, some of them are beginning to say, let's take it a little easy here. They knew from Malachi that before the great day of the Lord, Elijah would come. And they're kicking things around and knowing something's going down here. Verse 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the spirit. In other words, um, the power was, he had the power to take his life. He could call down a legion of angels. But this was meant to be. He was the Passover lamb. For that day, he became our Passover, our high Sabbath, and he is our Sabbath even to this day. What does Sabbath mean? It means rest. You're not going to have any rest in this world unless you have the Lord and Savior. Verse 51, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. 
and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Now, it's important that you know, if you're, you know, about 3 p.m., is when Caiaphas would be going into the Holy of Holies, one time a year. That's all anyone was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, and that had to be the chief priest. And just as he's about to enter, that veil was rent from top to bottom, ripping open the entrance to the Holy of Holies. I would like to have seen his face. And what was God saying to you? Even today, he was telling you, the Holy of Holies, my altar, my presence is open to you whenever you need me. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You don't have to be the high priest, especially one appointed by a Roman governor. Anyone is free to come in for I am here, I am with you uh, always. <clears throat> and certainly, from that moment on, when that price was paid, the King of kings and Lord of lords, his kingdom was established, and you are a citizen of it, even to this day, in the preparation of the great kingdom that is to come, in bringing forth to the congregation, as he requested, in Psalms 22 and reiterated again in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 2 to carry that message to the, to the congregation. It didn't say to the world, to the congregation, to the believers of exactly what was going down and what was going to happen. That he was there for you. And this is why when somebody says, I'm really lonely, you should not be. He is with you. He rent that veil and asked you to come on in, to be with him, now to love him, for he paid an awesome price for you, that you have him to lean on, to speak to, to pray to, and to obey. But most of all, to seek, and you will find. He opened it for you. Take advantage of it. It's always there for you. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. Listen a moment, won't you please? Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world it was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? Zeke. All the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular tapes. How, was the, what, how and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you've always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We're not going to judge people. We have a judge. It's our Father. You do have the right for spiritual discernment, to spiritually discern whether something is true or false. That's a gift from God. Don't uh, let him know, and uh, he will grant that gift to you when you ask, when you seek. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure hearing from you. You got a prayer request, you don't need the number, and you don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. All you have to do is talk to him. He's a mind reader. He can read your mind. You don't have to say it out loud, even. No one can ever prevent you from praying. 
because they do not know whether you are or not. And, and so it is. Uh, it's so easy to be wiser than the serpent and yet at the same time be as peaceful as a dove when you use what's up here in your forehead called your mind and, and taught of God through the whole congregation. With that being said, let us go to his throne. Father, around the world we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Lynn from Florida. And thank you for your comment. When an evil person is delivered up before the false Christ, will he hate the false Christ thinking he is the real Christ, or will evil know evil? No, he'll, he'll probably, he'll, he'll be persuaded by, when, when you read Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 down through 18, Realize the magnitude of the miracles Satan works in front of people. It deceives a lot of people. It's awesome. As you've heard me say before, snapping his fingers and lightning coming down from heaven. That's impressive. And naturally, if you haven't read God's word to be prepared for that, you would be impressed. But when you know him, now the evil person will probably, will, will no doubt worship him. That's human nature. Uh, Alvin from North Carolina. My life until I was old enough to make my own decisions to go to church, my grandma took me. She was a good, God-fearing woman, for she loved the Lord with all her heart, mind, and soul. As a child, she would read the Bible to me, but she believed in the rapture. As I can remember, she didn't have an education. She died in 1999, and I seen my own eye, in my own eyes the Lord took the string of death, sting of death away from uh, her. She was 93 years old. <clears throat> in her days, I guess growing up, she was taught fire and brimstone. I watch you every day. Do you think our Father in heaven will forgive her? Well, she didn't do anything wrong. The, the, you have to do an act simply believing in something. She didn't worship the false Christ because he wasn't here yet. It's those that are taught he's coming to fly them away. When they worship him, when he comes, that's when the sting takes place. But she's home safe with the Lord and, and a God-fearing woman, and you can rest assured she's uh, pulling for you in every way still yet, uh, t teaching God's Word. Leah from Louisiana. Um, it, um, it means a lot to me to know that you feel, how you feel about the racehorse business. Would you own a racehorse or be involved in the business? Do you think a owner, trainer, or jockey can be blessed from God in these businesses. Since I got saved, I'm confused if it's right or wrong for a God, a God, child of God to be involved in this for a career. I've owned lots of horses and I raced them on my own cattle. I, I you know, um, the only sin around a racetrack is habitual gamblers that take their children's food money and habitually, because they have a, an habitual habit, betting, uh, you can't blame that on God's little beautiful horses. Um, if somebody has their entertainment money, which they fed their family, their payments are made, and they buy a ticket because they love this particular horse, there's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> but what makes it wrong is when somebody becomes a habitual, that, that means they'll even, they'll even trade in their whole house on a bet. That is wrong, and God does not approve of that. But um, I, I love animals, always have, always will, and um, I, I would not in the least bit worry about that. Janet from Tennessee, I thought I heard you say that Cain was not Adam's son. How, how is this true? Well, have you read Adam's genealogy in chapter 5 of the book of Genesis? You're not going to find Cain there. 
because Cain wasn't his son. You will rather find Cain's genealogy in chapter 4 and Cain's offspring. Uh, many people do not understand the Hebrew manuscripts in Genesis chapter 4, verse 2, where it says she, Adam knew his wife and she conceived, all right enough, and she bare a son. It was Cain. That was the first. They were twins because verse 2 says, instead of again, it says she continued in labor and gave birth to a twin, which was Abel. Uh, Jan from Tennessee, anywhere in the Bible does it say the government will be run by children? Uh, of course it does. In Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4, it states that in the end times when people don't know any better, that he said, I'll, I'll put children in with that's children's child minds in control and see what happens to you. It's not a pretty picture. Isaiah 3, verse 4. Deanna from Kentucky. If a person attends a church that is teaching the rapture, are you doing wrong by attending? I never, ever tell anyone where they should go to church. I never judge a church. Um, the reason I, I believe what I teach I feel that God's election are directed by God, certainly not me. And if God has you attending that church, maybe there's somebody there that you should plant a seed with or if they ask you a question. The only way you could incriminate yourself is if the second epistle of John, you need to read it, absorb it. That can, you know, if you have a conviction concerning second, the second epistle of John, then, then that would be a time to be very careful. You certainly wouldn't want to support false teaching. Okay, that, that becomes a whole different thing. But many times God places his election where he wants them. And, and uh, certainly uh, he is quite capable of directing his own children. So uh, you have to answer that one for yourself, but I would highly recommend reading the second epistle of John right before the book of Jude and Revelation. Pauline from Florida. My husband recently passed away. Will I see him again when I get to heaven? Yes, you will. It's documented in Ezekiel chapter 40. We go into the millennium. In other words, everyone is translated into spiritual bodies in Ezekiel chapter 40. And in chapter 44 of the great book of Ezekiel, it stipulates that we will recognize our immediate family and be able to even help them if some of them didn't make it. That is, help them in the sense of saying, get your act together, a little discipline. Larry from Arkansas. In the latter times, it says male and female will preach. Please tell me the scripture that says, and can females teach uh, Father's word? If well, Father wants them to, they can. But it, it does say that females will teach and prophesy. You can read it in two places. It has to do with the end times. You can read it in Acts chapter 2. This is what they spoke in the Pentecostal tongue on Pentecostal day. And, and then the prophecy written long before that fact, the establishment of the church, took place in Joel chapter 2, where it stipulates about the locust army, how it would swarm, and how in the end times it would swarm and become uh, quite an oppo opposing army, and, and uh, that the, both sons and daughters would be delivered up and witnessed before that. Uh, no gender uh, there, just servants of God. Anthony from Florida. If God knows everything and the elect are predestined, then does the elect still have a choice or is it already set? What would be the reason for things if God already knows? God knows uh, who his elect are because he chose them before the foundations of this world. Why? They stood against Satan then, and he feels they will now. Uh, God's elect have free will. 
and they sin. And when they sin, boy, will God thump your gourd because you know better. And he, he rides a pretty good herd on his elect. He will say in Hebrews chapter 12, because I love you, I correct you, I chastise you. And God will. He'll, one of his elect, but they still have the freedom to sin if they choose to. But uh, they can rest assured they're going to the woodshed big time. But uh, God wants people to love him. You cannot know because you have to, to love must originate within each entity. God can't order it. He can't uh, devise it. He won't. Why? Because it would be false. It would be, it'd be, it'd be like a mannequin, a rubber mannequin saying, I love you, love you, love you, love you. It wouldn't, it wouldn't mean anything. So he has to give you free will. And you have to decide whether you're going to love him or follow Satan. That's what he wants to know. And he will not interfere with that. Uh, Credence from South Carolina. I would like to know more information about your church and how to be a member of your church. Well, we're, we're a Bible teaching church. We're not a denomination. We teach God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. We have one shepherd. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to join this church, all you have to do, you take it up with him. No one here can give you uh, admission. You, you've got to let the Lord Jesus Christ do that. If God accepts you, then, hey, you're in. You are a member. So that's it. But it's up to the Father. He, that's why it's called the Shepherd's Chapel, because it is his chapel, and his word is taught freely and openly. George, George from Georgia. My parents died when I was young, and I went down many wrong paths just to survive. I was just wondering if there is any hope for me in the afterlife. Well, there's, there's hope even now. You don't have to wait for the, that's the beauty of Christianity is you don't have to wait for the after, afterlife. You can have it now. What we've been talking about today in, in the scripture, the crucifixion, that he died on that cross for you, you know, old, poor old Paul, he, he persecuted the church badly. And he, he kind of felt like, well, I was so bad God couldn't forgive me, but God did. But he always brought it up that he was, he was the least worthy because he had persecuted the church so much. But when God forgives, it's over. It's complete. You have a new, fresh start. He paid an awesome price for you to have that right. So you repent of all your sins. You just talk to him when you're ready to. And immediately, you've got a new life. You're, you're starting afresh. Mark from Virginia. I have, a, I have a, a thorn tree in my yard. I keep it pruned and everything and everything, but is that a tree of the devil? No, it isn't. God created all the trees. Sometimes God will use symbology to teach a lesson. And where the thorn tree maybe gets a bad reputation, he, it was the bramble bush, which is a thorn bush. And all he wanted to, among the trees for one of them to be king mocking us about us wanting a man king instead of accepting God as king. And none of the trees wanted that responsibility, not even the grapevine. But here comes the old bramble bush, the thorn bush, and says, I'll, I'll be your king. But if I'm going to be your king, you've got to promise me you'll come into my shadow and worship me. Well, there's just one problem. A thorn bush doesn't, a, a bramble bush doesn't have a shadow. It's just an old thorny thing. And uh, so naturally, uh, he, it was a falseness coming out the gate. But that's only an example set forth. There are many trees with thorns on it. I'm thinking about um, locust trees um, and uh, various types of trees that will have thorns on them. Even the beautiful rose, uh, though 
It's hard to come by a rose tree, but it has thorns. It's a beautiful thing. There's nothing evil about it. Maria from Texas, can you please clarify Luke uh, 16, 26? It says, you cannot pass, so how can we help? You're not, Maria, you're not rightly dividing the word of God. Luke 16 is paradise today and has been since the crucifixion. Okay. Uh, that's not the millennium. Uh, that's not paradise as it will be in the millennium after the second advent, okay? Uh, you will be able to talk to your loved ones during the millennium. But paradise today has that holding pattern until the millennium. And then that particular part changes. We can go there then. Ezekiel 44 declaring it, it's... It is four chapters into the millennium from the beginning in chapter 40 in Ezekiel. Tony from Georgia, if you don't have money, should you not go to church? Because so many pastors talk about tithing 10%, and it makes, me, it makes you feel bad. Well, um, never let money keep you out of church. You can't buy your way into church. You know, Tony, this is the reason at Shepherd's Chapel we never take an offering. We, we have a box at the back of the church, and what you do there is your own business. But if you don't have any money, what's 10% of zero? It's zero. You don't owe anything. And uh, no one should bother you because of that. Uh, so uh, be that as it may. And... Um, God doesn't send out beggars, but I will not judge churches, so you're on your own on that count. Jeremy from Florida. Does God see you as, a, as different if you kill men during war? He, many times a hero. Okay. When Christian nation goes to war, it is to protect Christian, uh, the Christian nation. It's to protect our children, our families, and God's armies have always protected family. It's biblical, and certainly um, it is, uh, there's a great deal of difference in killings in war and lying in wait evilly and murdering an innocent person. Okay. There's not even any comparison whatsoever. I, I think it would do you well. Uh, I kind of got a feeling that maybe you... <clears throat> are a service person. Uh, and if I were you, I would read Psalms 144. What does it say? It's a soldier's prayer. God, give me the strength to destroy my enemy, okay, to overcome him. Uh, why? Because they, they harm Christians. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I very, being a military person myself, having experienced combat myself, I really do not like it when some preacher tries to put down brave men and women that have protected this nation, putting them on some guilt trip because of their, because of the preacher's ignorance concerning God's word. It's, it's a shame. Cassie from Virginia, if we are deceased when the Antichrist comes on earth, then how will that work? Because we won't be able to meet the Antichrist. Well, you, you would be one of the remnant rather than one of God's elect, which there's no difference, but uh, it, it would, uh, you would probably be hook up with the army that Christ brings with him to do battle with the elect at that time, at the second advent. Jeannie from Pennsylvania. What is the deadly wound? Well, you can probably, let's first decide what, who receives the deadly wound. Well, the one world political system is what receives the deadly wound. Well, how does a one world political system receive a wound? Politically. It, uh, you can witness it quite often, <laughs> okay? It, many things can cause a, a deadly wound to a political system. The main thing, it falls apart. Man can hardly ever put all things in one basket and get it to work good. You're going to have cast out, throwaways, mix-ups, separations. 
And that's what causes a deadly wound. But who shows up on the, in the same verse, 13, 4, Revelation, chapter 13, verse 4, same verse as the deadly wound. Who shows up? The dragon, which is Satan, in all his glory and beauty, for he is. And he brings peace to the world. But why? Because the world thinks he's Christ. And many churches that wait for it and have not taught are going to rush to him. That's sad. No one can take any pleasure from that to see the deceiver in his, at his best deceiving. This is why Christ would say in Revela Matthew chapter 24, the first war warning concerning the end times, don't let somebody deceive you that come in my name claiming to be a Christian preacher and mislead you. Don't let it happen. Uh, Rita from, uh, from Florida. If there is only one God, how can the Son, Jesus, be sitting on the right hand side of God the Father? Well, uh, God wanted to be our king, so he sent a king. He, he caused one to be born in the flesh. Uh, he, read Hebrews chapter 2. I'm out of time, as I've discussed today, and you'll catch on to it. I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, it makes his day when you study his Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse and gain the knowledge that God would have you gain. It makes his day. And boy, when you make his day, is he going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, Listen to me, listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The sons of Eli and Samuel, the last two judges of Israel, sinned against the Lord greatly. The people of Israel witnessed the corruption of the priests and judges and rejected God as their ruler. The people wanted a man to be king and to reign over them instead of God. First and Second Samuel records the history of Israel evolving from a theocracy to a monarchy. God warned Israel that a man king would take their sons to serve in his army, their daughters to serve as cooks and bakers, the best of their fields and vineyards would also be taken and given to the king's servants. Israel refused to heed God's warning and said, we will have a king over us that we also may be like all nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So first Saul and then David were anointed king of Israel. Would God's prophecy or Israel's expectations of a man king come to pass? You'll enjoy many hours of in-depth Bible study with Pastor Ronald Murray as you study First and Second Samuel.
Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book-by-book, chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God. Let's get back into our Father's work. What are we going to do tonight? I'm going to have to put an appendix on the subject, Satan's downfall. In the last lecture, we, through Ezekiel 28, found that place where God sentenced that cherubim, known as Satan, serpent, dragon, Lucifer, the devil, to death. 